Alright, we're going to continue talking about solutions, and today we're going to talk about disillusion factors. Okay, it's going to be the primary, where am I here, primary factor that we're going to talk about today. Alright, now before we can talk about disillusion factors, we have to define disillusion. And disillusion is simply the process of actually dissolving something. Okay, dissolving a solute into a solvent. Remember, the solute is going to have less volume, the solvent is going to have more volume. And we can speed up this process, and we're going to talk about how we can speed up or how we can slow down this process, or in essence, just necessarily affect it. Now, there are three ways to speed up what we refer to as dissolution. Remember, fancy word for dissolve. Okay, one, increase the surface area of the solute, bring more of it into contact. Uh, number two, agitation, stirring, or shaking the solution. Number three, heating the solution. Okay, all three of those things will typically um, speed up how fast something will dissolve. Now, for surface area, if we kind of go into all three of those a little bit more in depth, the first one is surface area. Um, surface area is how much of the solute is exposed to the solvent. Okay, um, the dissolution will occur at the surface. It's got to come in contact with it, or otherwise it has to come in contact with something in order to dissolve it. So the more finely divided the solute is, the greater the surface area, and the more quickly it will dissolve. Um, the easiest example that I can give of this is if you take a sugar cube. Now you guys may not have um, seen sugar cubes in a while, but if you break that up into lots of little pieces, Okay, it's going to dissolve faster. All right, same thing if you've got a big giant chunk of ice, if even though we're talking about a physical change on this one and just melting. But if you have a giant chunk of something and you divide it up, it's going to dissolve faster. So that's really all we're going for on that one. Okay, agitation is a fancy word for stirring or shaking. Okay, so that makes things go faster. Um, it increases the rate of dissolution because the solute particles are more evenly dispersed. All right, and it brings fresh solute in contact with the solvent molecules. And you guys have all done this. Anytime you add, you know, sugar or a powdered mix like a lemonade or an iced tea or something into liquid, okay, if you stir that up, you know, with your spoon, okay, it's just going to make it move faster. And so it's going to speed it up and allow it to dissolve faster, okay? Now, heating, this all comes back to kinetic energy. Um, for temperature, if temperature increases, um, the rate of dissolution will increase, or again, it will dissolve faster. Why? Well, it all relates to kinetic molecular theory, because the solvent particles will move faster because they have a higher kinetic energy, because kinetic energy, temperature are directly related. So if you increase one, you're going to increase the other. And this will help, again, to separate the solute molecules from each other and evenly disperse them. Okay, so it allows you to um, quickly mix things or increase that process. I'm sure if you can hear the bell ringing in the background. Okay, now with heating again, this just shows you, and we'll look at some curves on this, um, but solubility, you've got 100 grams of milliliter in temperature, and it's not uniform, okay, but typically if you look at these, like particularly if we look at glucose, um, sodium nitrate, um, another organic compound with sodium right here, as you increase the temperature, it allows the solubility to go, to increase, okay? There are a few exceptions to that down here. Um, sodium chloride, it actually goes down, has a negative slope, um, and then cesium sulfate has a negative slope as well. But for the majority, if you look at this equation, or look at this graph, you can read it as if you heat it up, the more is going to dissolve. And that's usually a general term um, and a general way of looking at things. And we can use that to our advantage. Okay, now if we define solubility, for every combination of solute and solvent at a certain temperature, there's always a certain amount of solute that can dissolve. Okay, or in other words, there's only a certain amount of material that that solvent can hold. And it depends on the characters, characteristics of the solute, the solvent, and the, te and the temperature. So it's, it's kind of everything all, all in one, but there is, and typically, as you saw on that last slide, a lot of times it's in units of oops, grams <laughs> per milliliter, okay? But that's a way to reflect how many grams can be dissolved in milliliters of solution, because the majority of the time, again, we're looking at solids being dissolved into a liquid. Excuse me. All right, now for solubility, as the solute particles dissolve, um, some will hit the surface of the crystal and actually reattach 
kind of reattach back. And this is a term that we call, um, see if I can get the pen here to work. This is a term that we call recrystallization. Okay, so that actually is going on um, while we're while we're doing this stuff. Now, eventually, the rate of dissolution and recrystallization will uh, um, be equal. Okay, and what's this? Will this create? This will recreate what's called solution equilibrium. Okay, now for solution equilibrium. This is a state in which the opposing process of dissolution and recrystallization will occur at equal rates. And I'm going to show you a picture on this next slide that hopefully will make this um, oh, a little bit easier to understand. And we're going to define this term equilibrium a few more times over the course of the semester. But the whole key is that, that the rates are equal. Okay, so for example, right here, let's see if we can do this here. Um, this first one, this is when you first dump whatever material you have into the solution. So this is our fancy word for, word for dissolving or dissolution. Okay, you dump this in and it starts to dissolve. It starts to mix in. Okay, now, so that's the up arrow. Now, the down arrow, that's coming back down here, and you'll notice that the up arrow is still larger. Okay, so this is a situation where the dissolution is still greater than the recrystallization. And again, just as an explanation, the up arrow is the dissolution, the down arrow is the recrystallization, but more dissolution, more is dissolving. And that process will continue to happen, will continue to happen until the rates are equal, where you get the dissolution is, whoops, bad equal sign, is equal to recrystallization run out of space there. But you get the point. They're equal and so this is a situation where we have solubility equilibrium. And it's important to note that although you cannot see anything from the outside, from the outside it looks exactly the same, but right on that surface you do have particles that are dissolving and as soon as some are dissolving some are recrystallizing. So from the outside it appears equal. On the inside we still have some changes going on. Okay, now we got to define um, saturation levels. Okay, and again, you did a lot of this vocab already, so it shouldn't be too hideous, I don't think. But saturated solution is a solution that contains the exact maximum amount of dissolved solute. Okay, so when you're making lemonade, this is the exact amount of, of powder you can put into the to the to the water and still to, to dissolve. If you add more, it's going to fall to the bottom and it's not going to be able to hold anymore. There aren't enough water particles to surround them. Now, an unsaturated solution on the other side is a solution that contains less than the maximum amount of solute. Okay, so this is a little like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, um, and that the um, you know saturated is right is the exact equal amount. Unsaturated has less than the amount. Then you're going to see we're going to get to a situation where we can create what's called a supersaturated solution. Now a supersaturated solution contains more than the maximum of solute. And you may go, well, how the heck does that happen? Well, we force it to happen. This can be created by heating up a solution and dissolving as much solute as possible. We have to allow it to cool undisturbed. Um, this and it will recrystallize quickly if seed crystal is at, if a seed what we call a seed crystal is added. Um, this is how they make rock candy. <laughs> and before you ask, I've never had success with it, so it usually does not work well. Um, let me do this here. Oops. Whoa, hey. I want to be able to write on it. Um, this is how you make rock candy. And I'll explain the process and hopefully be able to show you a video of what that looks like. Um, but we're, it's never worked well in class, so we're not going to do it. All right, super saturated solution. So here you go. You, we heat this up. Okay, so under here, we'd have a whole bunch of fire, maybe a Bunsen burner or something. We're going to heat it up, heat it up, heat it up. As soon as we heat it up, we add in a bunch of stuff. So we add in a lot of... Um, a lot of material. Okay, so we had maybe a whole bunch of sugar because that's what we refer to with rock candy. Now what happens is you put a seed crystal in there. Um, a lot of times if you ever tried it, this is where you put the, the string in the rock candy and then it will recrystallize. Okay, so you end up with these crystal formations over time. 
it's a tough one to pull off, but hopefully I can find a good video. All right, now a couple other things we got to talk about is when things will dissolve and when they weren't won't. And this is a situation referring to like dissolves like. All right, now this is a rule of thumb to determine if two substances will dissolve in each other or not, particularly two liquids. And it all comes back to bonding and intermolecular forces. And that's why we spent some time reviewing this. Um, but the majority of it is that polar substances will usually dissolve polar substances, and nonpolar substances will usually dissolve nonpolar substances. And that's because similar intermolecular forces, they can actually react. Remember, polar substances, you're either, either dealing with hydrogen bonds or dipole forces, whereas nonpolar substances, you're dealing with London dispersion. So if they have similar forces, they can intermingle. If not, they're not going to intermingle, and that's just chemistry. Okay. Now, a couple of unique situations or terms that we refer to with liquid. Whoops, I want the highlighter again. There we go. With liquid solutions, is this? Is these are the two terms of what's called miscible. Same exact thing we were talking about on the last slide, except this is simply a situation that when we talk about liquids will mix well. Okay, for example, benzene and carbon tetrachloride, they're both nonpolar, they both have weak intermolecular forces, so they will easily mix. Immiscible substances are so, two liquids that are not soluble in each other. For example, when you take that um, Italian dressing out of the fridge, you've got oil, which is nonpolar, you have water, which is polar, and they make a nice definite um, separation and you have to shake it in order to force them to mix together for any length of time. Okay, that's what this picture is showing you here. You've got the vegetable oil and the water. These little red dots here show you the hydrogen bonding and that is what keeps them separate. Okay, um, oil, London dispersion again, water has the hydrogen bonds and the dipole dipole and London dispersion, hydrogen bonding being the strongest so they will not mix. All right, last thing we got to talk about is pressure insolubility, and this is a unique situation um, where there's not much of an effect when we're talking about liquids and solid solubility. There is a pretty big effect when we're talking about the pressure um, related to solubility of gases in liquids. All right, so what does that look like? Well, this is where you have a gas and a solvent to make a solution. And when pressure is increased, it puts more gas molecules in contact with the surface of the liquid, so more will be dissolved in the solution. And you may be going, well, when the heck is this important to me? Well, if you have drank a soda pop anytime, <laughs> this is important. This is how they get the bubbles into the liquid. Okay, and so in essence, they have the gas, they put it under a lot of pressure, and it traps it. So just to show you what this looks like, you've got liquid, you've got gas particles, they increase the pressure, and they're going to force more of those gas particles into the solution. And when you drink that soda, as soon as you take the, the um, cover off, you're releasing the pressure, and that's what it means when soda goes flat, is that those gas particles aren't under the same amount of pressure, and therefore they may escape. Okay, all right, so that is a dissolution factors, and we will pick up with molarity, um, dilution, and solubility rules in the